All right, Aaron, you can go ahead and start. I'd like to welcome you this afternoon to our Beef and Forge Focus webinar. These are webinars that are held on the first and third Tuesdays of the month. And today, Dr. Carla Jenkins, who's at the Panhandle Research and Extension Center, is with us talking about what an animal unit month is and its use in uh, pasture and range management. Carla? Thank you. Um, so today, we're going to just talk about some of the calculations that producers can go through um, to estimate the forage availability that they have and determine how to use that. So understanding forage use and availability will help producers manage the range resource a lot better. Um, good management practices are important for long-term sustainability of our range resources. This was especially obvious this last year when we had the drought. And if we don't keep a good handle on how we're grazing our pastures, we can certainly see damage to them that will uh, take a long time to recover from if, if they do at all. So we felt like this webinar might be useful if we went through some of the calculations that we do to figure out how much carrying capacity um, pastures have and how much cattle really use. So some of the terminology that we use when we're doing these calculations are things like an AUM, or which stands for animal unit month. So one animal unit month is 780 pounds of air-dried forage. So that's 90% of the moisture removed. If we want to put that on a day basis, what is that one animal unit used for a day? That would be 26 pounds of air-dried forage. Okay, so that's just your month divided by 30. And an animal unit of beef would be, in this system, 1,000 pounds. So one animal unit would be a, an animal that weighed 1,000 pounds. So since not too many animals weigh right at 1,000 pounds, that would translate into, if you had a 1,200-pound cow, that'd be 1.2 animal unit equivalent. If you had a 300-pound calf, that would be 3 tenths of an animal unit. But a bull, if he's a 2,000 pound bull, would be two animal unit equivalents. And our bulls are something that sometimes we don't really make the full calculation for when we're grazing. Um, and they do eat quite a bit. So we need to make sure that we fully account for how much they have to have when they're in those pastures as well. So now we're going to talk a little bit about estimating forage demand. So if we say that this cow had her calf at the end of March or early April, then in May, even though that calf is already starting to eat, nibble some forage, probably not going to make a big dent. Um, typically, by our calculations, we do not um, account for that calf at that point in time. But by the time we get to June, that uh, late March born calf is eating enough forage that we really need to account for how much the calf is taken in, too. So the pair, the amount the pair eats becomes critically important as we go through um, the grazing season. And we need to account for the fact that that calf is eating about 1% of his body weight in forage, even while he's nursing the cow. And that slowly increases to uh, more uh, as a percent of his body weight and equates to more forage that he's actually taking in. And so we really need to um, consider that as we rotate to the next pasture that that calf is beginning to take on um, a lot more forage. So this would be kind of our typical grazing season, um, May through October. This might be about the animal equivalent units that a pair uh, would represent over that time. So we need to estimate the, um, that forage demand and figure out how much forage we're actually going to need for our herd. And if we're rotating through pastures, um, we probably need to account for the AUMs that they are, or the animal unit equivalents that they represent at each move. Um, so October would be different from May. We need to probably account for that every time we um, go to move a pasture. But for this example, and for simplicity's sake, we're just going to assume that we're going to have a continuous season-long grazing. Um, but we're going to have plenty of acres to do that on. And so uh, we're going to just take an average of, to have an idea of how much would we actually need for the entire grazing season. Okay? 
So if we take the average of what those pairs need from May to October, they, they come out as an average of 1.4, okay? And then the bulls, we've got to have them in there part of the time. So let's assume that we are a producer who has 100 pairs, and we're going to have four bulls that run um, two of those months during our breeding season with the pairs. So if we take 100 times 1.4 times the whole six months that we're trying to graze, that's 840 AUMs that our pairs are going to need for that grazing season. The four bulls um, are going to take two animal unit equivalents each, and they're going to be in there for two months. So we're going to have 16 AUMs that we need to account for for the bulls. So we're thinking about this whole grazing season for this herd, we're going to need 856 AUM. Okay. Now, that was our forage demand. That's how much we're estimating that those cattle are going to require. The next thing that you have to think about is what's available. Just like everything else, what you need and what you have may be two different things, and you need to know that up front. And estimating forage availability can depend on a lot of things. The vegetative zone that you're in can be a big factor, and we're going to talk about that on the next slide. The soil type that you have impacts how much grazing pressure you can put on a pasture. The range site, whether um, it's a lot of choppy sands or it's sands or sandy or, or whatever it is, whatever your range sites are in that pasture, uh, have an impact on how much grazing is available there. The plant species, uh, not only just the individual species make a lot of difference with what's available, but whether it's predominantly cool season and warm season uh, can determine when you might be able to get the most grazing out of those pastures. And so those are all things that impact how much is actually there. And rainfall, as we were reminded very sharply this last year, has a big impact on how much forage availability is actually out there and what you can actually graze. So we'll start with the vegetative zone that we mentioned uh, first. This is a map that's been adapted from the USDA Soil Conservation Service, and it shows the vegetative zones. It shows Nebraska divided up into four um, vegetative zones from west to east. So the first zone, zone one, is out here. Um, Scott's Bluff, where I'm located, would be included in that. So the panhandle is out there. And there is a precipitation gradient that goes across these zones as well. So um, if we're sitting out here in the panhandle, over time, our general rainfall um, in zone one is typically 14 to 16 inches a year. So when we go into zone two, a lot of the western sand hills are included in zone two. Zone three would include a lot of the eastern sand hills, and then uh, zone four would be the very um, eastern part of the state. And by the time you get to zone four, 30 to, 40, 30 to 34 inches of rainfall is more your, your typical average rainfall for that area. So you can tell that this is why we get kind of upset when people make generalizations from east to west across the state of Nebraska because it's very diverse and the amount of grazing that you can do in, say, Saunders County is going to be different than what you can do in, in Banner County, clear out in the Panhandle, um, because of this rainfall differences and the vegetative differences that occur because of that. So you have to know where you are, for one thing, and to understand your capacity, your carrying capacity. So this is a table that I um, also adapted here, and I tried to blow this up. And this is an estimate, okay? So if we're just estimating, well, how many, if I bought this place, how many cows could I run? So you, this is just a general estimation. But it has the vegetative zone divided out, and then if we look at, say, a, a common uh, range site across all four of those vegetative zones, you can see how the carrying capacity can be different. So if range condition is um, good, let's say, in um, zone one, and we're going to go down here, um, one, two, three, four, five lines, so we're going to look at a sand 
site, if it's uh, good condition in, ve in vegetative zone one, so say we're out in uh, Banner County, um, good, fair to good, not uh, always see a lot of excellent, but there's some. But let's say that uh, it would only carry uh, 3,800 hundredths uh, of an AUM per acre. If you go to that same uh, sand site in vegetative zone 2, um, that changes quite a bit from 0.38 to 0.53. Okay, so there's a little more carrying capacity there. If this shows zone 3 and 4, and again, if we go down here and we look at the sand site, then we get clear up to 0.68. And down here, up to 0.75. So big difference between 0.75 and 0.38. So knowing uh, that carrying capacity has a, a, a major impact on that. The other thing that's important to know on that is the condition of the range. And I'm not really going to cover a lot of how that's calculated here. Um, I do have some resources at the end of this that, to help with producers who really want to get a better handle on that, but um, if you're assuming that your range is in excellent condition and it's actually somewhere between fair and poor, then clearly the carrying capacity is not going to be what you think it is. So that's a place to start on that. So let's say, okay, this is how we calculate this. We have a carrying capacity on a pasture of native panhandle range. Um, it's 0.3 AUMs per acre is, is what its carrying capacity is. Um, let's go back to the original example that we calculated where we had the 100 pairs that were going to be out there for six months and there are four bulls that were going to go with them. So remember, we, we calculated that they were going to need for the grazing season 856 AUMs. Well, how would we know how many acres we would need if this was uh, 0.3 AUM per acre pasture. Well, we would take what we need divided by what we have, and that would tell us how many acres it would take to, um, to run those pairs for um, the grazing season. Okay, so it takes quite a bit when you get out into an arid region um, like Panhandle. Okay, so those were tables that we used to estimate some of those things. Those are estimates. That's a place to start. But that doesn't, um, it's not something that you can just say, okay, I looked up this table and here's what I have. So how would you know if you had, uh, what exactly your pastures had? Maybe you're a great manager and you have more than, than what it estimates. Uh, maybe you bought the place and somebody else abused it and you have less. You need to know that because while we want to have long-term sustainability of our range, we also want to get good utilization out of our range. And, and you can't do that unless you know what you're working with. So one of the things that we can do is take a hoop or a square of a known size, and we can randomly place it in the pasture. And we need to do this in several different places across the pasture, because obviously pastures have a lot of variation in the pasture, so we try to account for that by doing several replications of that. So we can put that down. We can clip with clippers everything that's in there. We can put it in a bag. Um, it's good to air dry that forage out on the dashboard in your pickup or in your sunroom, um, somewhere where it can kind of dry out. And then we, if you have a little gram scale, um, then you can weigh the amount of grams that that uh, grass, that air dried grass ended up weighing. Okay, so this is again something that I adapted from the NRCS, but there are different sizes of squares or hoops that a person can use. I would say this one that's almost two feet square um, has a almost, a, it has a 4.9 um, circumference on the, if it's a hoop. This is probably one of the more popular ones. And so if that's the one that you're using, then all you have to do is take the grams that you weighed of the air-dried forage times 50, and, and that's a conversion factor to get to pounds per acre. If you're using a different sized one, say you're using this um, smaller one, then, then there's a different conversion factor um, 
So uh, that's how you would determine how many pounds per acre um, a pasture would have. So then you would just average the hoops that you that you got in a pasture. So once we do that, so we're going to clip that hoop down to the ground, but obviously if you're grazing cattle, you don't want to clip it that close to the ground. So we're not really going to count that as all being available to the cattle. So we have a philosophy that we call take half, leave half. You would want to employ that to your hoop as well. So 50% of what's in there, uh, what you clipped out of that hoop would need to uh, be left there so that the plant itself can regenerate its roots, um, have some growth to it for next year, um, store carbohydrates, that kind of thing. So you don't want to totally wipe out the plant. 25% you need to account for the fact that we're probably going to have grasshoppers or some other kind of uh, forage-eating insect. Cattle trample where they eat. They defecate where they eat, and then they don't want to eat that. So we're going to have some that we're not going to get to account for. So when it's all said and done, and you did all that clipping and all that weighing, you're really only going to get to use 25% of that or account for using that. So an example of what we would have just done if we were just out clipping plots, after we dried that forage and we weighed it, let's say we had 20 grams in that um, that middle hoop that we were talking about that is uh, 4.9 feet in circumference or 58.9 inches um, circumference ring. And we're going to multiply that by 50, and then that's going to give us 1,000 pounds of air dried forage per acre. But we're only going to get to use 25% of that for the cattle. Okay, so um, we take that. And then we divide what we get there by 780 pounds um, of forage, because that's an AUM. We talked about that in the first slide. That's how many uh, pounds of forage one 1,000-pound uh, animal would consume in a month. So then that tells us, when we do that calculation, that that pasture has 3,200 uh, of an AUM per acre available for grazing in it. So um, Clearly, that, that pasture must have been out here in the panhandle or something, because that's not um, a lot of grazing, but um, still, that's, that's what that one came out to be. OK, so sometimes I have producers call, and they say, well, a guy's going to, um, he's willing to lease me his pasture, but he said there's um, 860 AUMs available out there. So what does that mean? How many, how many cows am I going to? Be able to run on that, or what I'm going to do with that. Well, a person has a couple of options in a situation like that. You could take those and you could stretch that out over the entire May to October typical grazing season. So if you're going to go six months on that, um, then you would divide that by the six months, and then you divide that by remember our average that we decided that over the season our pairs were 1.4 animal units. Okay, so that would mean that for six months we could graze about 102 pair on that. Well, let's say it's a, a very predominantly cool season pasture, and so the best quality in that pasture is is early on. Um, and then we've got somewhere to go with those cattle. We've got some summer annuals that we planted, and we want to take them there um, after that. So maybe we only want to graze that for three months. So we can do that calculation. OK, so we divide by the three months, and then what our average pairs are. Or you could go and pick the average of those three months that you're choosing. And So instead of 1.4, maybe that would be a little less, given the example that we used earlier. But um, if the pairs on that average three months were taking, uh, were re requiring 1.4 animal unit equivalents, then that'd be 205 pair for three months. So we're not going to run 205 pair for six months, but we could run more as long as we're out of there earlier and the grass has time to rest because we're taking essentially that same amount off, assuming that most of that's there to uh, begin with in that situation. Um, so let's say we have a pasture that's rated at uh, 5 tenths of an AUM per acre, and a producer has 600 pound yearlings. So those yearlings are 0.6 animal units. 
So if I take 0.6 divided by 0.5, that would tell me that for one month, um, that steer needs 1.2 acres. Okay, so that's another way to kind of put that in terms of um, what does that mean in actual uh, land space. Some kind, sometimes I get asked that. So then for a five-month period of grazing for that yearling, then, then they would need six acres, okay, because the 1.2 times five. Okay. Um, so estimates versus reality. Estimates make good starting points. We talked about that a little bit earlier, that we have some guidelines that we can go by, and they kind of give us places to start on what we might be looking at for a carrying capacity. Um, but those aren't the law. Um, lots of factors impact the carrying capacity of the range. Physiological state of the animal, like lactation versus dry, causes an animal to eat about 20% more. Insect damage, um, hail damage takes out a pasture. Drought slows down growth. Fire takes out a pasture. So uh, calculations that we make on paper from tables are starting points, but they are not a um, substitute for keeping an eye on the pastures. Um, maybe we made, uh, we didn't have enough hoops that we measured with, and so maybe the carrying capacity at range wasn't quite what we calculated. You'll know that when you go out there and see how those cattle are taking that pasture down, and you may decide, you know, we better move this, um, we better move these cattle. So you're not going to know that if you're not keeping a very close eye on those pastures. Um, I would say that it's hard to know if you're getting where you're going if you don't know where you've been. So it's very important to keep records of when cattle were in a pasture and how many AUMs you estimated you took off that pasture and rainfall it's had and um, lots of things like that. Keep records so that you can have a better estimate than a book value that we looked at earlier as to what the ability of that pasture might be over time. Um, there are some good resources for tracking and monitoring grazing days. Dr. Jerry Valesky out of North Platte is the pasture and forage management specialist there. He has a grazing records template that allows producers to, to plug into kind of an Excel format what they put in where and how long they plan for them to stay and kind of help them track. That has an extension circular number to it. Your local county extension office can help you find those things. There's also another publication that he and some other uh, range and forage specialists put together called Grazing Strategies for Semi-Arid Rangelands. That's EC158. Uh, if you go to your county office and tell them you need that publication, they can help you find that. But it's got some good ideas on how to rotate through pastures to manage them and keep the species of grasses that are in those pastures um, growing and, and so you don't lose species from grazing um, bad, I don't want to say gra bad grazing management, but sometimes um, you can overgraze simply by always going in a pasture at the same time every year. So they've got some good tips on how you can rotate through pastures to maintain a good um, species composition in your pasture. There's help if you need help monitoring your pastures, the NRCS office. Um, you can find your local NRCS office and they will help you set up a plan for monitoring your range, your UNL extension. People will help you uh, determine that. The Nebraska Grazing Lands Coalition will help with um, help you set up something to help you monitor what you're doing. So lots of, lots of help if you have questions. With that, um, I will take any questions if you have them. It's just one comment that came in, Carla, is that uh, Cindy Tesler and Bethany Johnson are working on a photo point monitoring app that uh, would be something to download to your phone. And for folks who especially have CSP contracts, that might be a valuable tool. So that should be coming out hopefully in the next couple months. Great. And that that's kind of goes back to the picture of the little guy, you know, knowing where you've been. Photos are a great way to um, help you remember what a pasture looked like and how it's changed over time because I don't know about other people's memory, but mine's not that great. I guess the other thing I would mention is the extension circulars are also available on the web uh, at the UNL Publications website.
I don't see any questions coming in. Carla, thanks for your time today. Thank you.